Well, Jim, whether it's Marina Shafir kicking someone in the face or Chris Champion kicking Rick Steiner in the face <laughs> or someone just trying to take flight and go over the top rope, there were botches galore all over the place this week in wrestling. And Woo! a lot of people have wanted to hear your thoughts on various things from SmackDown. And you and I both <laughs> watched this show. Well, you know, and actually, I hate that the the notoriety that this episode of SmackDown got was for top dollar, you know, in his attempt at flight when it was actually because of the match that they had was the best SmackDown I've seen in I don't know how long, just because I enjoyed some the one match so much. But we'll... We'll get there in a second. You want to start at the beginning? Save save top dollar for where he came in <laughs> when he came in for landing. Let's not do Edmund Morris style. Let's start at the beginning. Well, the first 17 minutes of SmackDown was Liv Morgan and Tegan Knox against Dakota Kai and EO Sky. And so I didn't have a lot of optimism at that point. And then there was 10 minutes of commercials and plugs and clips and packages. And then I was even less optimistic. And then Sammy and the Usos were in the back. They were all getting along. Sammy's all dressed up. Solo and Roman are on the way. Are they going to make Sammy Zayn an official Uso tonight? You know, so now we've got a little intrigue going through the show to the closing segment. And one of the Usos, I, I, I believe it was Jimmy, was like, I don't know about this now that Kevin Owens has popped up. So there's the there's the MacGuffin. Will Owens block Zane from becoming an Uso? I'm like, okay, things may be looking up. But finally, 35 minutes into the show, that's all that we've had that I just talked about. 35 minutes into the show, LA Knight's in the ring, cutting a promo. I'm saying, okay. We, we this guy can talk. He's got all kinds of personality, and it's about Bray Wyatt again. And I'm, uh, and he's been attacked and abducted. They kidnapped him apparently last week or week before last on one of the shows we didn't really care about. And he hadn't been able to get to Bray Wyatt. But at the same time, L.A. Knight's cutting a promo on him. He, I'm not impressed by you. All you've done is dress like a circus freak, talk a lot, and never get to the point. And you attack me and then claim that it was Captain Howdy or whatever. Boy Howdy. He's actually he said Boy Howdy. He's been listening to the program. And that's L.A. Knight can talk his ass off and this promo may be dooming him to an early grave after he just got back from one step beyond as Max Dupree. So L.A. Knight challenges Bray Wyatt to come down and get stomped on. And here's the spooky lighting and the music and the smoke. So much smoke. So much. It looked like the Freebirds had just pulled up in 1981. And here comes Bray Wyatt, and he talks his way to the ring. And he again says that he hasn't touched L.A. Knight, and he's going to give L.A. Knight one more chance to deliver his message. And, of course, L.A. Knight jumps him when, he steps, when Bray Wyatt steps in the ring. And Wyatt just drops down in the corner. He don't really sell anything. He don't really take a bump. He just kind of sat down in the corner on his ass and let L.A. Knight wail away, either with kicking him or punching him, whatever. And the only movement was really the camera zooming in and out until more music played. And there was a video on the screen, and it was Boy Howdy said, what have you done over and over? And then want to see something really scary? And during this time, Bray Wyatt is laying on his ass in the corner laughing and not even laughing and covering up, trying not to laugh because it's such a ridiculous thing that he's in the middle in, but he's supposed to be seen laughing. While L.A. Knight has stopped kicking him to yell at him and then starts kicking him again, but Bray Wyatt is not even trying to move away. He's just been cognizant enough to laugh at the whole situation, but he's not even trying to move away, much less sell. And then there's more music and fog, and out comes 
Not on the screen, but out comes Boy Howdy in the aisleway and tips his fucking hat. And both L.A. Knight and Bray Wyatt just stare at Boy Howdy and nothing happens. And L.A. Knight leaves the ring scared for no reason and Boy Howdy stands where he was and Bray Wyatt lays in the corner in the ring and they laugh over the PA system for almost a full minute. And laugh and laugh. They laugh and laugh and laugh. What was that? I, 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 they were trying to hit a hard out. I don't know. Somebody said, just laugh until we cut to black, go to black. I don't, I, I, I don't know. All right. Well, you seem dumbfounded. What do you think of Bray Wyatt's return to WWE now a couple months in? This is no, what the fuck? We said we were going to give him a chance because maybe when he was, you did. Well, I actually, more people, a lot of people said, Hey, they were saying, Hey, is what they were saying. Um, sure. The last time he was here, he was burned alive and he put on a horror movie mask and he was indestructible and you could hit him in the head with a fucking logger's ax and split his skull, but he'd come back next week. But it was all due to Vince. And people have been saying the guy can talk and the guy can work or whatever. Fuck. And he can talk. Problem is he never has yet got to the point and we haven't seen him wrestle. So we don't know if he, he can work. And we don't know what the fuck is going on here or give a shit at this point. And it's dragging LA night down now with him. So I, what do people like about this? What ever happens? How do you pitch it? I don't know. I think we're seeing the pitch on TV. Cause how would you have time to go through all this? Well, uh, I'm, I have nothing to say. I hate Bray Wyatt's stuff. He could talk, except he doesn't say anything. He hasn't had any matches. He can yet. work, except he doesn't wrestle. Well, I don't know if he can work either. I'm not. I've never <laughs> been a fan of his in ring. Other people like it, but this is terrible stuff. But look, just like with Mandy Rose to an extreme over there. When you say I don't know who likes it, there are people who like things about wrestling that have nothing to do with wrestling, and they don't understand why people just want a professional wrestling product. And those are the people who like this. Those are the people who think this weird, spooky, never-ending, goes-nowhere fucking stuff <laughs> is good TV, but it's bad TV and it's bad wrestling TV. <sighs> and we wanted them to use LA Knight. Look at how they're using them. I'm starting to think he may have been better off as Max Dupree. At least he got to look up his sister's skirt every once in a while when he was laying there while people were kicking his shit out of him. But anyway, the good news is Roman Reigns and Paul Heyman have arrived as we're 45 minutes into the program. But you watched Ricochet versus Gunther for the Intercontinental title. I did because you insisted that. Well, you said that you really liked it, so I thought that meant I should check it out. And the, the people in the building liked it as well. And I thought because of this match, this actually was the best episode of SmackDown I've seen in a while because this was the best match from any company I've seen. Well, MJF and Starks actually in a different way last week because it meant more because it was a main event. It was a heavily advertised thing. It's MJF is the top guy over there now. But for a match, this was better than anything that I've seen in a while. And I will be more than happy to tell you why. But I already feel like you're going, well, what, are you, what are you talking about? What was different? So you didn't like it. No, I thought it was good. And I thought, like you said, the crowd was into it. By the end of it, some of the reactions to the near falls were really good. Okay, I thought the you were The fans believed it. To... The fans thought they were about to see it happen. Yes. And, that's the be and, and again, they didn't have to do anything stupid or silly or unbelievable to get there. And that's why I thought you were going to poo-poo on it for a minute there. But that was my, my worry going in. Gunther, I've said, is always the perfect wrestler in that he always does and says and has matches like what you would think he would do, right? He doesn't do shit he shouldn't be doing. He doesn't let usually his opponents do shit that shouldn't be in that match. And I'm thinking, okay, can he make this plausible? The size difference 
is ridiculous, but with Ricochet being a a good underneath underdog babyface when he's led, we've said this before, when he's in there with another flipper and they try to do flips, it's just silliness. But he can be led. And if it was anybody else but Gunther, they would have probably tried to feature all this fucking guy's gymnastics and not actually have him sell and fight and get the people with him. And it would have been a flippy match and blah. But this was, I had flashbacks to watch an Ernie Ladd work with Ricky Morton in 1984 in Houston, where Ernie was, he was ready to retire. That was his last year in the ring. His knees were shot. He was hurting. But in Houston and what he meant, he was still going to go. And he got in and did more with Ricky Morton than he had to do for his status at the time. But it was all plausible. It made sense. There was a 12-inch height difference and a 130-pound weight difference. And by the time that Ernie took a bump off a drop kick, the people were standing and fucking screaming. But anyway, nevertheless, they Gunther and Gunther called this, make no mistake about it, because they're the only thing that I saw that I would take any style points away whatsoever is Ricochet is a little tentative because he's not used to this style match when a guy's feeding him his head without having it to be called or these uh, Gunther's over there and Ricochet's wailing on him. You can tell Gunther wants to wants him to take the head a little bit before he does, or he wants him to kick him in the back of the head because he's feeding it or whatever. A little tentative in a couple places, but otherwise, they started out wrestling, and Gunther stayed in control most of the match. I even I wrote down a play-by-play -play because I wanted to see if they went wrong, and they didn't. If every time that Ricochet would swarm Gunther, Gunther would stagger but not fall, and he would stop ricochet with a one high impact move like a big boot or the chop or whatever and through the first segment which was five minutes gunther was yet to take a bump but still ricochet was in it the idea was that gunther being the more dominant physical bigger guy would control the tempo and what was going on but that ricochet would have flurries fighting back from underneath trying to create space, use his quickness and agility to outsmart the bigger guy, blah, blah, blah. And when Ricochet would fight back from underneath, they came back from a break in the second segment, the people would get with him. But then Gunther would shut him back down with two chops and a body slam. Boom. And then he'd take his time. And he would continue to give hope spots, but never be in danger. He would wrestle like a heel and maul the face, and, and fucking be surly in his attitude, and keep the smaller guy fighting back, but never taking over. And that's a key to it. Because again, and you couldn't, this match would work pretty much in a vacuum, but when you've got a guy like Ricochet that they're familiar with, that they want to see, you know, do good, and like you said, that you can get them primed to where they think they're going to see the change, this is the kind of match that gets the people in the arena behind that guy and behind that story and believing they're going to see it so that it comes across better on television because there's a bunch of people screaming for this fucking guy. They're not sitting there on their hands like in most WWE matches. And when, when Gunther got the Boston Crab, Ricochet was actually able to fight and squirm out of it because he's a smaller guy. He's a little squirmy. And he would fight back and stagger Gunther. And then, that's what I was talking about. He was fucking wailing on him, and Gunther fed him the head. He got the headlock, and Gunther hit the fucking Billy Robinson backbreaker. Fucking brilliant. And a two count. And went right back to the Boston Crab, and then switched the cross face. He's still working the kid's back. He's trying to slow him down, either the legs or the back. And Ricochet got a rope break. And I wrote down, this is great. And then Gunther manhandles him into a rear naked choke. And that's if you watch Gunther's hand and arm action, when he lays hands on a guy, when he grabs a guy, the, his hands are so big anyway. But he doesn't just 
put his hand on somebody, expect him to fucking follow him around. He grabs up. You can hear when he lays his hands on somebody or when he snatches them, he's doing it in a working way, but at the same time, it looks like he's being physical. <clears throat> and then he started kicking it up at this point in the match, chopped the shit out of Ricochet in the corner. But then Ricochet would duck one and fire back. Boom, boom, boom. Had him staggering all over the place. Drop kicked him into the corner. Gunther still is not taking a bump, bump off of Ricochet. And then again, Ricochet goes for the suplex. Gunther turns it into a gourd buster, then hits a big drop kick. Goes for the power bomb. Ricochet turns it into a hurricane rana, takes Gunther over the top rope, and he lands on his feet on the floor off of the apron. And then Ricochet comes off the apron with a drop kick, and Gunther finally takes a bump on the floor. 15 minutes into the match, Ricochet jumps up and fires up, and the people are with it. And then Ricochet hits his springboard moonsault, and Gunther takes another bump. And now they're like, holy shit! And they go, there's their break spot. They're going again to another segment. And they come back. And Ricochet hits another dive to the floor, and Gunther goes down again. But then as Ricochet goes to the top, Gunther catches him and it goes up after him and gives him a German suplex off the top rope. Ricochet lands on his feet. He does the backflip over him. That was impressive because it was the counter to a fucking move this huge guy had given him, and Gunther turns around and sells like he's astonished that this could fucking happen. And Ricochet hits a leap and knee lift, but Gunther catches him with the big boot and clothesline, two count, big pop. They're not going through furniture. They're not burying the referee. They're not fucking doing ridiculous things that would require hospitalization. They're doing wrestling moves and getting covers and near falls and people are into it. And when Ricochet was selling like he was dead and Gunther goes for that just big splash off the top, not a shooting star press, not a spinning turning triple Lindy, a big splash from a big fucking 260 pound fucking guy. But he eats Ricochet's boot because the quick little kid's more resourceful. And then Ricochet does hook up and get a vertical suplex on this big bastard. And the place blows for a vertical suplex and a two count. And then Ricochet goes to the top. And he is the flippy guy, so he hits the shooting star press. Boom! And it looks like it hurts him, too. And he covers. One, two. Gunther kicks out. Big pop again. And now Ricochet's going crazy with the chops and the lefts and the rights to Gunther's face. And Gunther's rocked and staggering and drunk-legged. But he's not taking a million bumps. But Ricochet is in control, finally. And then Ricochet hits two super kicks and it staggers him. And he goes for a drop kick and Gunther chops him down. Bam! Snatches him up and power bombs him. Top spread. One, two. He kicks out. The people are standing on their fucking feet. And Gunther gets pissed like you would and throws a fit. He's beating the mat. I can't believe it. And he pulls Ricochet up to his knees and Ricochet reaches up and slaps the big bastard in the face and drops back down, selling to his knees. He's shot, but he's not going to go down like a fucking dog. And Gunther slaps him back and pulls him up into a big fucking twisting power slam. Boom, one, two, three. What a fucking 26 minutes from the start of the entrances to the finish and it never got old i if they'd have had picture in picture on this instead of all the shitty stuff we don't i would have watched the picture in picture on this i loved it hold on here one second wait a minute well you've always felt that way about gunther or walter whatever he was at the time does this at all change the way you see ricochet well, yeah, yeah, not really, because I've said before, he especially, he'd be a great kid's baby face. 
And he's a great underdog. He's a great athlete. And he's small, so you've got to use that. And he's got to use that to his advantage rather than detriment. But he gets uh, hung up on the gymnastics when he's in there with somebody that either does the same thing or doesn't know how to call a match like Gunther, then all, that becomes all that it is, is just the flipping and the flipping and the flipping and the contrived flipping. But in this one, they may, Gunther made the people see this guy as a gutsy guy that's going to fight back from underneath and going to slap the big fucker in the face. And that translates more than the flips and the gymnastics. That's for the, shine part of the match that's for the you know blah 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 it's great for television some but to really make the guy important he needs to be put in positions like this where they can care about him feel sorry for him and want to see him overcome adversity because the fucking high wire or the trapeze in the circus only goes five or ten minutes this went 26 so you're not against the flips, you're just against them being used in a way that's... It's the, in a way that's ridiculous, overdone, contrived, choreographed, silly, or more in a more modern wrestling style. But when it's story-based, when it's something that's telling the story of a match and used right like this, you have no problem if, with it. If he did about one-tenth of the amount of acrobatics he does, and it was always in matches like this that, that counted he would have a career about 10 times as long and be 10 times as over. Because you tune out when the guy just does everything, but when he does shit like this, when it matters, either the fucking backflip off the top or the goddamn hurricane runner where he took the guy over the top rope with him and then hit him with a drop kick, shit like that, as the high spots, that's where the name came from. High spots are both supposed to be the high spots of the match, not the steady content of the match. That's when he appeals to everybody, not just the trampoline wrestling fan set. Because everybody does that. But not everybody can have a match like this. And some of the people who want to do that need a trampoline, apparently. Absolutely. Yes. Um, is that coming up? No, actually, there was more... <laughs> There was more with the bloodline. And folks, and on the experience this week, we're going to talk about Raw because I've determined from reading the recap that I'm just going to sit down when I have time to zip through everything but the bloodline segments, which they intersperse through the three hours trying to get you to watch. But anyway, but uh, Roman and Solo and Heyman and Jimmy Uso were in the back and they were asking Roman what he has planned and Roman wouldn't tell them. And basically, you know, that's where Jimmy said, if, if Roman, if you don't want to make Sammy cause of Owens, it's okay. And Roman tells Paul Heyman to call Adam Pierce. Conveniently, they go to break. And when they come back from break, well, Adam Pierce is, he's a power walker anyway. And he's always, he's Johnny on the spot. You can't, uh, you can't get anything by Adam. So he was there in three minutes. And he comes in the locker room. And I guess they've done the deal where Pierce has fired Bobby Lashley for gross mishandling of a referee. And not an even in a friendly way. So Roman says that he'll get Pierce out of the trouble that he's got himself into with Lashley if Pierce books Roman Reigns and Sami Zayn against Kevin Owens and any partner he so desires, right? And he say, it could even be you, Adam. I think Adam probably passed on that. But the question was asked tonight, and then Roman laughs because they're not going to give away tonight. Well, where? And Heyman jumps in. How about live network TV on December 30th, right here on SmackDown? And Reigns agrees to that. So we know that tag match is going to happen on the last SmackDown of the year. And that was the update on the Bloodline situation. And then we come to the fork in the road. Now, then we come to the three-way tag team number one contender match. 
between the Viking Raiders, the Lucha Suits, and Skid Row. And each of the teams has their female valet, manager, handler, mistress, as you like to say, whatever the case, in their corner. Well, I like to say mistress when it's a mistress. I don't think any of these women have been shown to be mistresses for any Well, you right. used that term the other day. About a mistress. Well, and, and that hadn't been established. But we nevertheless, we, 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 had, uh, we got Zelina Vega, we got B-Fab, and we've got Val Halla. That's her name, Valerie Halla. Remember, from the uh, Poughkeepsie Hallas. They're a big family up there. So I already knew by the time I watched this, because it went viral, it was actually infectious is what it was. I knew what was coming. But even before we got there, I got to be honest with you. Every time that Top Dollar gets in the ring, it's visually fascinating to me for whatever perverse reason. I mean, it, it, every time he touches somebody, it looks like he's a wacky waving arm inflatable tube whale. His arms are just flailing and his, and his, the baggy, basketball outfit that he wears and he he obviously is convinced that things that he is are is doing are impressive and that he's over because of the demeanor and the attitude he takes with it and the grandiose it's like he's the rock about to give the people's elbow have you seen this am i imagining this no and i completely agree with you and i'm happy to hear you say this he's utterly fascinating to watch because it's like a guy has no experience in the ring at all, and they've just put him out there, even though we know he's been trained by them. Yes, it's it's like, like I said, the you know the basketball dad that you know gets to play with the kids on the weekends, right? And he let me show you how I used to do it, and he can't do anything, but he's acting like he's doing everything. And and when, but Michael Cole said he's lost almost a hundred pounds. What the fuck did he start at? By the way, he looked better, bigger now that I see him. Well, because he's 100 he has, pounds of weight loss. He's had no discernible physique to the point where I would say he's almost stoop shouldered. There's no arms there. There's no muscle tone. It's a, a, admirable if he's losing weight. If he, if he was trying to be what he looks like, which is a 40 year old car salesman that tries to play basketball on the playground with the kids on weekends, it's admirable he's lost 100 pounds. He's trying to be a pro wrestler. He may have lost the only look that he had that was any good if he was 400 fucking pounds because this, but my God, again, when he, he teased the dive a time or two and it was like, he looks to the hard camera. He knows where the camera is and he knows the motions to make. It just, again, looks ludicrous when he makes them. It looks like he's a SpongeBob SquarePants character down at the bottom of the ocean, kind of waving in the the sea. So well, anyway, but, but the other thing that you're kind of glossing past is he behaves like this. And B Fab at ringside, she's got a great look. She's also behaving like this is a big deal. The fans are not reacting to anything he does. They've already no, decided because, that they don't yeah. like him. They don't like Hit Row. They're not interested. And and that's, you know, it's like he's leading, he's conducting an invisible choir with the fans in his head that are cheering for him and anticipating this. So finally, he teased the dive a time or two, and finally, he went for it. And they had contrived the situation where almost everybody in the match, I think maybe everybody in the match, was over on one side of the ring to attempt to be the catchers for this fucking fiasco and he sees he's in the ring all by himself and he looks at the hard camera and gives it the look like oh and he gives some kind of finger sign he should have given the thumbs down i think it was just three fingers down and a thumb up your ass i don't know what the fucking sign was supposed to be and he hits the far ropes and he starts running across the ring And he jumps head first. And Brian, you've seen the guys do the Undertaker did this one year at WrestleMania where you do the head first dive and the hands out. It's like Superman taking off out the window and going over the top rope. And you've seen it before where 
a guy will get all the way over the rope and then his feet will hang on the top and that will stop his momentum and he'll go crashing face first to the ground. You've seen that a number of times, right? I have, yeah. Well, this wasn't that. What this was, was this fucking guy did the goddamn George Reeves fucking push off and the Superman jump out the window on the old TV series. And the only part of him that made it over the top rope was his arms, his head, and his chest. <laughs> his belly caught the top rope. And because he had flown into it with all of his heart and soul, him hitting that top rope with his stomach so fast, he immediately snapped him upside down to where his fucking feet flew straight up in the air and his head not just went head first to the apron but he was spinning at such a rate that his face flew underneath the bottom <laughs> rope he almost dove over the top rope and ended up back in the ring i've never that would be impossible but he almost did it so when he came down, his feet are going over now, and his head and chest are underneath the bottom rope, which has the luck of fools and whales has turned him over to where he didn't go head first to the floor. It tur and he just rolls off the apron of the fucking ring on his feet and walks off like he did something. And meanwhile, everybody that was standing there waiting for it. They all just fell down anyway. Even he never even touched anybody and they all just crumpled to the ground. I have never I, it was like <laughs> the top rope gave him a big backdrop. I have seen guys use the ropes for moves, but I've never seen the one of the ropes use a guy for a move. <laughs> you know and what? It, and this is one of those and this is one of those cases where WWE production helped because they made it look a lot better than it was. <laughs> oh yes, because the fan cam footage on Twitter from different angles of it showed just how ridiculous because you couldn't tell from the official TV version how far he was from missing everybody that fell down anyway. You could still I mean there was no way around the fucking flip. But then did you ever see his tweet afterwards, after I told you about it? Well, he blocked me, apparently, at some point, so I didn't well, I'm see I'm blocked, too, but the fucking websites were actually picking it up, going, look at this, what this guy's saying now. And they would embed it in there, but basically, after this became the talk of the town, so to speak, the topic of conversation amongst polite society, well, old top dollar, I guess he got his feelings hurt. He, you know, he he tweeted out like, you know, thank God, prayer hands or whatever, that uh, I'm okay. My foot gave out. His foot gave out on the jump is what happened. And he, he tweeted a clip to prove that he could do it. He said, here's a clip of me when I was 50 pounds heavier. And apparently it's, I guess, at the Performance Center because he's, I, I assume he's been in the WWE program. He's never wrestled for anybody else. So it had to be at a Performance Center. This wasn't the Performance Center itself. It was like a small rec center or something, a Performance Center show in Florida. It was one or two rows of ringside, that type of thing. Everybody's got to learn somewhere. I'm not knocking that, but I'm saying this was not on television. And he tweeted this clip. He said, I'm 50 pounds heavier. Here I am doing... Well, in this case, yes, he's exactly right. He took off running, and he dove over the top rope, and he cleared that some bitch, and he went straight over the other side and went right in between all the people that were trying to catch him face first to the fucking floor. And that's the, the clip that he tweeted to prove that he could actually do it. So he can prove he got over the rope, but he still had never proved that he can actually hit this fucking thing. In general, is that a bad idea? The whole idea? Well, you saw me botch this, but look, I used to be able to do it. Well, yes. I mean, there's so many bad ideas and things wrong with that wrapped up. The one is that he's doing it anyway. He wants to be cool. You can tell he thinks he's cool already. 
and he wants to be cooler. A 300 and whatever pound guy marked down from 400 and whatever shouldn't be doing a goddamn dive over the top rope even if he can, unless it's The Undertaker at WrestleMania. I'll go for that. When somebody's getting a seven-figure payoff to do it and somebody's getting a seven-figure payoff to stand underneath it, but this fucking moron for a flat salary and the idiots that were standing there not knowing he wasn't going to land on him, here's the goddamn thing again. Is sure, yes, some of these uh, Felix over in AEW, he does a lot. Well, no, he falls on his ass and head a lot too. I mean, it's, uh, one of these acrobatic wrestlers may be able to nail this shit every time without hurting themselves or anybody else. Maybe that's possible. I don't know. I can't call that person. I've never been dove on, nor have I dove upon anyone. I just fucking worked and made money. But I'll tell you what, I, I've known a lot of smart wrestlers and a lot of successful wrestlers and a lot of wrestlers that made a lot of money and a lot of wrestlers made a lot more money in wrestling business than I have. And I don't know any of them for just every goddamn television match or every time they're in a house show or every time they're anywhere that they would want to stand there at ringside underneath some moron diving off of or over the ropes onto them, and whether they were singly standing there or in a fucking group. How many times have we, was that Ridge Holland? He caught a guy on a fucking dive, blew his fucking quad and had surgery and was out for months and months and months. Uh, same thing happened 20 years ago to goddamn uh, Scott Putsky's son, or Scott Put Ivan Putsky's son, Scott, caught Brian Christopher, blew his fucking leg. We've seen guys land on their heads. We've seen guys give themselves concussions. We've seen guys turn ankles or whatever the fuck, and not the worked turned ankle of the balding buck the other week, but actual injuries. But besides that, what nobody is thinking about, and I'm surprised is not more prevalent, if you're standing there, even if you're in a group of five wrestlers that should be able to catch 300 pounds, you're not catching a 300-pound sack. You're catching, especially this uncoordinated whale-like individual, allegedly going to fly over the top rope. Where are his elbows coming? The top rope's nine feet off the fucking ground. So the guy's going to be coming from 10 feet, whether he's 200 pounds or 250 or 165 or 300, no matter how coordinated he is. He's flipping, he's spinning, he's doing a backflip. Where's his knees coming? Where's his elbows coming? Where's the back of his head coming? If a bunch of people are reaching up to catch him and, he, and, and he's coming at a high rate of speed and he weighs a couple hundred pounds, where do their elbows go? Related to my fucking face if I'm behind them. It's stupid for something that everybody does in every fucking match. It's a needless risk for a momentary pop that all it does is look phony and give the trampoline cowboy fans something to fucking clap about for 10 seconds and give them a quiz. Stand at the door at the end of the show as they're all filing out of the arena and say, describe the most impressive flip of the night and who was standing there to catch the guy. And see how many can put down all the fucking names. So you just risked your goddamn face and your dental work or potentially fucking blowing a knee or whatever the case to be a miscellaneous extra in a fucking mosh pit to catch some idiot that may or may not be hitting his target. Fuck you. Have you ever seen someone try to, do, I can't even say it without laughing, have you ever seen someone before try to dive over the top rope? That side shot from the fan cam showed it. He didn't even leave the ground. I mean, no. I mean it wasn't even like a jump. It's, you can't even call it a jump. He, like just <laughs> the top the top rope of the ring is a, in the WWE is approximately five feet off the off the mat, and he hit it with just the exactly his center of gravity his belly button area, and he's six foot six, so he was standing on his tippy toes and got three inches of air at best. 
And actually, that used to be the way that Bill Dundee took his over-the-top rope bump on purpose. Because he was, he was, I've never seen anybody else do it, and he could nail it. It looked fantastic in that you would throw him, and he would just go stomach first into the rope, bend at the waist, handstand off the apron without holding any of the ropes, and go off onto the concrete floor. And that was a fucking great bump. He was taking it on purpose, not by accident. This fucking guy, and the, the rib is, this guy couldn't do this again in a million years. If he tried every day for the rest of his life, he'll never do that again. How much longer do you think the Hit Row Project will be on the air? Boy, unless there's pictures of somebody and goats, um, I think they're already looking for a way to, because they've already shortened everything up. Their matches are as short as they can get. But my guy, I mean, this this was the spectacular botch, but every, you know, the one kid, what, Ashante, he might be all right, but in between the, the girl just stares and looks out of place and dances around with the long legs. You can tell she, does, and they tried to have a match with, they booked a match with her a couple weeks ago and didn't actually have it. So that shows where her progress is at. So I, I, I this guy bumps like a drunk in a slip and slide is basically what. <laughs> <sighs> anyway. Uh, oh, but there's more to the match. Now, wait a minute. We, 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 we got to get to the finish because they got the girls at ringside. So the girls got in and did spots with each other. And it looked like they nearly killed themselves. One came off the turnbuckles to the floor with a Herc and Rana that fucking went sideways. I don't know what the fuck. But then finally, the finish was one of the lucha suits was going to run at top dollar and top dollar was going to scoop him up for a double team move where he would scoop him up and hold him in his arms like you were rocking a baby to sleep. And Ashante was going to drop kick the guy while he was up in his arms. He was going to go backwards with him, right? Can you visualize that? Somewhat. Well, they can't. Because apparently, again, as much preparation goes into these things, they had to have to come up with this move. If it was their idea, which I don't know why an agent would say do this, so it had to be their idea. They had to have at least gotten a ring and said, look, I'll pick you up like this and he'll come from here. And when they got to it, it fell the fuck apart. The guy's coming off the ropes at top dollar. Top dollar goes to scoop him up. And when he scoops him up, the guy's momentum is still going. So top dollar almost loses him. He bends over and he's trying to keep him up in his arms, but they almost fell through the fucking ropes on the other side of the ring. The guy in the, in top dollar's arms had to grab the top rope to steady himself. So the top dollar could get under him to pick him up. Well, now top dollar has turned around and he's got him up in his arms like the rocking baby. But now Ashante is not on the right side of Dollar to do the drop kick. Dollar. So instead of being in front, and he should have been right in front. Go back and watch the DVR. He should have been right in front of Dollar and jump up and drop kick the guy in the chest. But instead, he's on the right side, 90 degree angle of Dollar. So he just jumped up and kicked the fucking guy that Dollar was holding wherever he could hit him, which which basically knocked Dollar off balance, and he just fell backwards with the fucking guy. And they said and, and Top Dollar sold his their own finish. He was late. He took the bump and Adonis pinned the fucking guy while Dollar is laying there selling their own fucking finish with a look of pain on his face and holding his ribs because it probably hurt him. Oh, God damn it. Oh, we might. I'm about to get the vapors. I'll tell you what. Oh. Whoa. It was that, a scream. Extended scream. A scream over on SmackDown this past week. Was that the main event? No, no. The main event was the bloodline. That was just the match that probably ran all the people off. The bloodline come to the ring and their from their entrance to the first word spoken was only four minutes this week. It was quicker than normal. They probably, they were running low on time 
And Roman asked to be acknowledged and then fairly quickly got to it and hugged Sammy and brought the house down. Then he said it was going to be a good night for Sammy, but we got a KO problem, Kevin Owens. And Roman reveals the solution that they mentioned earlier, the tag team match. And Sammy is responding to this, well, of course, anything you want, you know, but, but uh, you know, it's like it's not that way at all. And I'm, I'm Kevin Owens' only friend, so he won't be able to get a partner. And then Roman is like, you're his, well, I mean, I used to be his friend. I'm not his friend anymore, but he won't be able to get a partner. And then suddenly, up on the screen, and again, these are the moments this was built for. Every time something pops up on the screen now in every segment, especially in AEW, but even on this show, it's generally a letdown or it's generally the fucking guy that they could do the same thing if they were talking to each other or it's just somebody that you don't want to see to begin with. If it was only for moments like this, moments like this, it would actually have much more meaning even still. But up on the screen pops John Cena. And of course, that gets everybody's attention. He got a text from Kevin Owens and he did a great promo and he built the match and he built the ratings. And the premise is, He's had a match on SmackDown every year for the 20 years, you know, that he's been there, except for this year. And if he doesn't beat the end of the year, he'll break his string. So he'll be there December 30th. He knows how he's got all the personality in the world. He's not even half-assed trying, but he knows how to sell the fucking match. He knows how to get the date across. He knows how to build some anticipation. And boom, and that's going to get some talk and, and uh, notoriety, and there you go. And that's the way they go off the air. And so, actually, as a television show, number one, besides the first, what was it, 45 minutes, we got a great fucking match that shows the kids how it's supposed to be done. Uh, we got... Uh, one of the, the biggest modern superstar in the business today is going to come back to network TV to fucking give the ratings nice kick in the ass at the end of the year and further this fucking story with the bloodline. And we got to see one of the most ridiculous sights of the year of this pompous fucking sperm whale being goddamn brought down to fucking earth, literally. So I'd say it's a pretty good goddamn program. What do you think about using Cena like this? Not on a pay-per-view, not a big match, even on Raw, but he'll be on the last SmackDown of the year. I don't know how the ratings traditionally are for that for Christmas week. That's how they're using Cena for the first time all year. What do you think? Well, not for a pay... What pay-per-views are there now? Royal Rumble in January. Well, but at the same time, our, I mean, priorities are switching. I'm not saying what pay-per-views are the Royal Rumble. I'm saying what everybody pays per view on the Peacock along with viewing 7 million other fucking things. It's, it's not, this is not the UFC. It's not pro wrestling anymore. It's not the big fight, the big match. We're going to pay $50 to see the two biggest stars in the world fucking collide in this epic fight. It's, Fox is paying us more than we're probably getting from Peacock or from this part of Peacock or whatever the fuck. Let's see what we can do for the ratings. And it's also when we can get John Cena. So I, in, in this case, yes, their rights are going to be renegotiated coming up as everybody's been talking about in the next year, year and a half. Uh, this is, this is what it is now. Network television. And I wish they would start treating the rest of SmackDown and, and maybe even goddamn Raw like a pay-per-view or network television or we got to have some stars and we got to have a little more variety and we got to bring some big guns in and we got to have better matches and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, is Cena and Owens against Zayn and Reigns, see, it just and it almost even makes it. Zayn and Reigns. That's going to be a heck of a match because 
Owens and fucking Sammy's dicks are going to be hard for weeks leading into that because they love working with each other more than they love breathing. And Cena doesn't want to embarrass himself. And Roman Reigns is the big dog, so that it's going to be fucking good. And what will the story be coming out of it? So I think they've they've done good for that. They've done good for themselves there. If you had to make a projection, do you think next week's SmackDown will be any good? Well, I'll tell you what. You know, I'm doing pretty good with the projections because now you know you got me. You got me, Brian, started on the daily fantasy sports, the whole nine yards. I'm reading up on this. I'm almost ready to get into it because ever since that our friends at Prize Picks came along, it's, it's opened my eyes up to a whole new world because a lot of people think this is some kind of unsavory activity that you engage in with people out behind the pool hall in the alleyway and potentially somebody's wearing a visor but that could be nothing more could be further from the truth ladies and gentlemen because when you go to prizepicks.com or you download their app which i understand is very easy to do if you know how to do the apps well it's just you're entering a world of daily fantasy where and doesn't everybody want a fantasy every day where you can make entries on the player projections and if you select more or less for example, if you think that top dollar is going to fall on his ass more or less than six times in the course of a match, well, you select that, and then boom, and you can win cash and prizes. You can win up to 25 times your money. They've got this highlighted in yellow. On any entry, all you got to do, pick two to six players or participants, because they cover every kind of sport in the world here at Prize Picks. NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, college basketball, soccer, WNBA, welcome back, Brittany, esports, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, Euro basketball, cricket, and disc golf. Disc golf. And you can make entries within 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. And you, all you do is you just make your picks. And you don't have to play against other people. You just play against fate. You play against karma. You play against, well, you play against all these people doing these things that you're predicting they will or will not do. But as long as they will or will not do them, you'll make money. And right now, you can download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play the daily fantasy sports and first time users can get a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 if you use the promo code JCE. You put in $100, they'll give you $100. If you put in $50, they'll give you $50. Now, somebody somebody from Cleveland last Tuesday tried to put in $100 in 20s that they had made on the color copier. And that does not work, ladies and gentlemen. That's going to get you in big trouble because the people at Prize Picks don't like to do these things, but when you try to stick them with the funny money, sometimes they have to send people out to collect. We don't want to get in that type of situation. It's a real problem when they have to send someone to collect and that person's Blackjack Mulligan, and he's the one making the funny money to begin with. He's the one making the money, and holy mackerel. But you never know about the... But if, as long as you give them real, legitimate United States American currency, they'll match it. And all you got to do is enter that promo code JCE at your sign up for the instant deposit match. Put in the hundred bucks. They'll give you another hundred. Then it's up to you. You can win 25 times your money or you can be an idiot and lose it all. But these things happen to everybody. Prizepicks.com.